only three actors who can do anything meaningful about climate change. Corporations, governments, and consumers. So governments, we've been trying to organize governments to solve climate change. We tried at Copenhagen. We've been trying to get a big binding international agreement. And needless to say, that's not going very well. Corporations are moving, but the reality is they're not moving fast enough to make a big impact, and they're not going to move without some really significant pressure, either from governments or from consumers. So that leaves us down the bottom here with consumers. And consumers are the people that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about you guys. We got thinking, you know, having tried really hard to get some political mobilization happening around climate change and having tried to mobilize millions of people around Copenhagen and frankly having left that a little bit disappointed, well, maybe we should stop focusing on the political process and start focusing on consumers. What if we took this into our own hands? What are some ways in which we could mobilize consumers to much more rapidly shift their demand to a low-carbon economy. And at Purpose, the organization I run, which is all about this kind of work, we, we do experiments where we try to look for ways that large-scale mobilization of people can solve global problems. We started researching this problem. So what I want to share with you today is some of the results of the research that we're doing right now on whether and how consumers could rapidly shift their demand enough to make an impact on climate change. And I'm not talking here about, you know, kind of green deodorant. I'm talking about the big behavioral shifts we need to make in private transportation, to electric cars, to uh, renewable power in the home. These are shifts that actually could have a transformative impact on climate change. So uh, what do we do? Well, uh, the results of our research um, really are two main conclusions that I want to share with you today. And the first is a little startling, and it may create a little bit of, uh, of disequilibrium. And that is that uh, I think we need to kill the language and imagery of green in order to have any real shot at scaling sustainable consumption. Sustainable consumption just isn't working right now, as we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and we're going to have to kill green as a frame for consumers in order to try to rework that problem. But once we do that, there might just be a way that consumers could lead the transition to a low-carbon economy. There's something happening in the economy that's very exciting that we'll talk about. A movement that is enabling much more participation and much more rapidly scaled business models that, if applied to green consumption, could help shift our behavior much more quickly. So let's talk about our behavior. This is green consumption. The picture is pretty miserable. As you see, uh, these very important sectors like green power, hybrid cars, and, and soon electric cars have very little market share. The only categories that have significant market share aren't driven by voluntary consumer action. They're driven instead by uh, government regulation. So we've got this problem where green consumption is super subscale. So we could try just kind of tweaking the edges, but the reality is if we just kind of work with the existing formula, there's no way we're on a trajectory to get the kinds of increases in consumer demand that might mean that, as we believe is possible, a third to a half of the problem could be addressed directly by consumers. So let's talk about why that is. The first reason is that green has become meaningless to consumers. It's a funny thing. In many ways, uh, green is the victim. The green movement is, is a victim of its own success. Green has kind of crossed the chasm into the mainstream. It used to be a totally fringe uh, idea, and now everybody is talking about green. Corporations regard green as a kind of cost of doing business. And the consequence is massive saturation. You know, we just Googled green, and we got this enormous vomit of green. And, and the, the problem is that it's... it's uh, it's kind of ugly, right? It's not cool, it's deeply unsexy, and it's all super generic. And the problem is that everybody has appropriated this. You know, Green has become a lot like Bieber. He's everywhere. He's overexposed. And as a result, what was once very powerful, Bieber, uh, has now become just kind of diluted. We don't, we don't feel strongly about it. Second problem is the problem of appropriation. The problem is that Green is such a nice cultural idea it's such a kind of handy moniker that people have figured out that even the people who are opposed to environmental protection, that the best way to handle that is actually to appropriate. So this is uh, the Heartland Institute. This is a think tank in the United States. And uh, look at this lovely iPad app. It's green. The Heartland Institute's logo is a leaf. Um, maybe I'm going to get some great tips about energy-efficient light bulbs. But no, this is the Institute. 
that ran ads two weeks ago in the United States featuring the Unabomber and Osama bin Laden saying, these people believed in oh, climate change, they are mass murderers. If you believe in climate change, you must be like them. <laughs> so this is obviously like a real problem because the reality is everybody's cloaking themselves in green. So as consumers, when we see these signals, we don't take them seriously. Thirdly, we have the problem of deception. Um, and what, what's happening here is very interesting. This is a real ad that I want to play for you that I think is worth sharing with the world. There's something in these pictures you can't see. It's essential to life. We breathe it out. Plants breathe it in. It comes from animal life. The oceans. The earth and the fuels we find in it. It's called carbon dioxide, CO2. The fuels that produce CO2 have freed us from a world of back-breaking labor. Lighting up our lives. Allowing us to create and move the things we need. The people we love. Now some politicians want to label carbon dioxide a pollutant. Imagine if they succeed. What would our lives be like then? Carbon dioxide. They call it pollution. We call it life. <laughs> we call it life. Uh, enough said. So, so here's the thing, right? Uh, cl climate change has actually become very polarizing. So what was once a kind of a, uh, a unifying idea, the environment, now certainly in places like the United States, it's actually a bit of a wedge. So green consumption. We talked about those very low penetration rates. What do consumers intend to do? Does this mean that consumers don't want to buy green? Well, here's the funny thing. When you ask consumers, do they intend to buy those very same green products, on average, 75% of them declare an intention to buy green products. So what's happening? Well, I met these guys in Bondi recently who are starting a sustainable fashion brand, and I think their answer might give us a clue. So we started a a fashion label, and um, it's called... Yeah, it's like actually called nothing. Well, it's not called nothing, it's just not called anything. Yeah, I mean, you know, why waste resources on printing labels and all that kind of shit? We're trying to minimise our environmental footsie. Yeah. So, yeah, just trying to help the environment. True, true. Right? Yeah. It's such a claim, like a brand claim, you know? Here's what our name is, you know? We don't need to claim that shit. I feel like we kind of live our brand already. It speaks for itself. True, and when word of mouth travels, people will be saying, oh, have you heard about uh, the new fashion label? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there's this incredible gap, as our friends here uh, point to, between what we say when we ask them and what we do. So when we, when we ask people uh, what they intend to do, they describe themselves as being highly consistent. I will buy consistently across a range of green products. I'll buy organic veggies, I'll buy hybrid cars. Yes, yes, I will. And then we see what they actually do, and their consumption is all over the map. It does no way correlates to their stated intention. So we ran this analysis and we looked at different categories, and basically what it shows is that of all the different levers that might influence purchasing, green is perhaps the weakest of those levers. It's not a lever that's really driving people. And so basically, as soon as any friction gets introduced into the purchasing process, be it price, be it uh, lack of clear reward, be it any hassle in switching, people are out the door, right? So they like the idea of green. It's a kind of a value that they're happy to cloak themselves in. You know, it's a brand value. Um, but the reality is, market share just isn't there, because as soon as it's even slightly difficult, they're out the door. So what do we do? So here are some things that I think we can do that might upend this situation. And as I said, it does require starting with killing green as a frame. We can't lead with green. Because most of the green products that are out there start by knocking on the front door and hitting you on the head and saying, you know, we're green, OK? Do the right thing. We need a radically different approach to the way we introduce this issue to consumers. We need to put green aside. I think this is an excellent example of that. Paul and Kathy recently switched to solar with Sunrun. Sure, they've lowered their energy costs, but really, they did it to save dolphin babies all over the world. No, it's more the money thing. Yeah. But what about the dolphin babies? Well, that's great too, but we really like to save money. Yeah, we love it. But you love dolphin babies more, right?
So, so this is exciting, right? Because solar is one of those industries that actually perhaps the first big green product that could have a big carbon impact and could reach the mainstream. It could cross that chasm. Very exciting. And the reason for that actually is because prices of photovoltaics are going way down. The problem is that price won't usually be on our side. So in, in most cases, uh, you know, where we can use price, do what Sunrun did, that's fantastic, that's highly effective. You're using price as the mainframe, but you're subtly reminding people that there's actually altruism as well. But where we don't have price, because in many cases green products will be more expensive to make, we won't be able to compete there, we need to help consumers become more irrational. We need to help each other become more irrational. And so this is a challenge that um, I'd ask you guys to take up. So these are some of the big emotional levers, the, the, the motivators that actually drive purchasing decisions, right? So people who buy Louis Vuitton handbags are certainly not buying them on price, right? They're buying them because of status. They want to be associated with it. These are the drivers that make irrational consumerism, which is the underpinning of many successful business models. Uh, and, you know, it's why people go crazy on guilt group. Um, that, that is the driver that we want uh, to think about. So here's the exciting news. The exciting news is that new forms of online participation can supercharge those motivators that I just showed you. And by supercharging those motivators, you can enable certain new disruptive business models that can build market share for green products much more quickly. And so I want to give you an example outside of the green space and then return to the green space. That example is a very cool company called Kickstarter. Kickstarter is something that's um, growing rapidly in the United States, and it's crowdfunding for creative projects. And what Kickstarter does is it's found this amazing way to pull multiple motivational levers at once and create a kind of a social network that really supercharges that. So on Kickstarter, cool hipsters put up amazing creative projects and people are giving money to support those creative projects. They're getting a little bit in return, so there's a little bit of a transactional element, but they're also feeling like they're helping these hipsters do amazing things. They're part of something much bigger. They're seeing the progress and it feels to them incredibly cool. There's a real le leverage of status. And what's interesting about that is that because it's a network, because it's technology enabled, when something like that takes off, it really goes viral very quickly. And then it can um, eat up much more market share than these more traditional business models. So in the United States, in its space, Kickstarter is now approaching the eclipse of the National Endowment of the Arts as the largest funder of creative projects in the United States. So it's becoming the dominant market player. How can we apply this to green? Here's a very interesting company called Gettable. Gettable wasn't always called Gettable. Gettable used to be called Rent Cycle. And you look over there on the left, it's everything we, um, e everything we described earlier as the kind of the nightmare of green marketing. Gettable is the rebranded version of Rent Cycle. But Gettable is a very disruptive business. It's not knocking on the front door and saying we're a green business, but what it's doing is it's trying to scale rental, the rental market for products, for ordinary household goods that instead of buying, we could rent. If we could turn renting of products into the dominant consumer behavior, that would have a dramatic impact on the amount of wasteful consumption that we did. And Gettable is trying to do that by putting all of that rental inventory online and being the one-stop shop where you can go and rent and it's one of those cool collaborative consumption businesses that Rachel Botsman talked about on this stage a couple of years ago. And so it's a really exciting business. People are getting excited about it. And their entry point is I'm part of this cool disruptive sharing business, not, you know, I want to I rent bikes from Rent Cycle. Here's one more business in the green space that I think is very instructive and very exciting. It's called Solar Mosaic, and it's a business run by some friends of ours. Solar Mosaic is about community solar. The problem with solar is that not everybody has a house that they need a solar panel to put on, and so that limits the large-scale adoption and scaling of solar. So what these guys did is they said, well, let's have a network solution. Let's just put solar on broader community spaces all over America. And when we put that, we'll have people pay their little bit to kind of crowdfund, like Kickstarter, it's kind of Kickstarter for solar, these solar panels on those roofs. So it's quite exciting because what it means is it scales the adoption of solar and it gives people a sense of community and identity and solidarity in doing that. People aren't primarily driven by this abstract notion of green, they're driven by that solidarity. Thirdly, we need to build a bigger tent. And building a bigger tent 
is one of the ways we're going to enlarge green from this niche thing that's about that 2% of hardcore people who are changing their behavior to something much bigger. And the exciting thing is that the tent is potentially much larger. If you think about a broader conception of the new economy of progressive consumerism, you see that sharing economy, fair trade, ethical production, local, uh, and even those guys who are creating those tech businesses that don't necessarily see themselves as green or see themselves as progressive are actually all part of a common worldview. They're all trying to remake the economy. So if we can build a movement that organizes those people and that takes those people and puts them together and helps them understand their shared interests, their shared values, much the way we did in Australia with GetUp, where everybody came at different issues like refugees and climate change and reconciliation, we helped to put those people together under a common banner. We could build something much more powerful that breaks ourselves out of that 2%. So what's the future that we want to envisage? So today we're in this small little dot called green. We're not getting out of the 2%. We're not scaling. The answer, we think, is to get behind the businesses that are at this intersection of mass participation, where you can get lots of people in a network, you can grow market share very quickly, um, and these new forms of businesses that are green, but don't knock on the door and announce themselves as green. If we can do that, if we can create a new economy that takes these models that can very quickly acquire market share, and we can give people a sense that they're part of something much bigger, we'll build the green economy, but we just won't talk about it and we won't say that we're doing it. So that's, that's a thought for you, and um, very much hope that we can make that happen.